Amy, how much did you know about Anthony's life before you actually started talking? Nothing. He was the guy that lived three doors down that would walk his dog past my house. I mean, my mother told us we have to move because somebody could come and kill us. There's people that are angry. I have returned to the world of the Mafia, this time to meet the wives, daughters, and girlfriends of some of the most notorious gangsters. Many have never spoken publicly before. Most of these women are really in love with us. We're not good husbands. We're halfway good fathers. <laughs> and a wise guy should never be married. How much money would you take out to go shopping? Give me a figure. <laughs> this much. They have money, they have power. So you get caught up in the moment, you do. We were given unprecedented access into their lives. It's a world many of these women never chose, nor is it one from which they can ever entirely escape. Your father's life at the Mafia must have brought you pain, which at times seemed absolutely intolerable. Okay, when you're living that life and you know you see your dad going out and committing these crimes, it's, it's obviously hard to deal with and it's painful. But you don't realize the pain until it ha actually hits your home. You know, until you actually have someone murdered. Amy and Anthony have been together for six months. Unknown to Amy when they met was that Anthony is a former high-ranking member of the Colombo crime family, for whom he extorted hundreds of thousands of dollars and committed murder. This is Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, a notorious mob neighborhood. And this is where Anthony grew up. This was a crazy place. People were dying left and right around here. People were killing. You never find the bodies all over the place. And you had a few crews around here that would just kill you in a heartbeat if you didn't want to pay them. Amy, you have never been to an area like this. You grew up in the Florida Keys. You have never been to New York before. I grew up between the Florida Keys and Fort Lauderdale, so just kind of beach bum and always water and boating and stuff like that. Fairly so, genteel. Yes. Are you surprised at the way things turned out, in fact? Absolutely. I say it all the time. I'm like, man, I sure do pick them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's OK. You can get out right now. now I don't want you to, to fight over this. No, we're not going to fight. No. Later on, when we get back to the hotel. But Anthony, it, it, it's very difficult looking at this area as it is now to think of what it was like, the way you described it when you were growing up. Yeah. Like this place right here? Yes. That was a bar it used to be. That's where I used to hang out a lot. I used to have my money, my Shylock money coming out of there. People used to owe me money, they'd bring it there. And on Friday night, I would go there and pick up all my money up, hang out, buy everybody a drink, and then go home. What were the consequences for those who didn't pay up? If they were good pays and they would pay me for a while, then nothing like that. I let them go a week or two. But if they kept on playing games with my money, then they, they know it was up. They, they would get hurt after that. Because I was a little aggressive. You describe yourself as a little aggressive. Yeah. What, what does that mean? It meant that when push came to shove, I, I shoved right away. I just didn't, I didn't talk right away. I would just go at the person and deal with it that way and then talk later on. Amy, are you still surprised to hear about that kind of aggression in the life that Anthony had in this area? Yeah, it's hard for me to listen to it and hear the things because that's not who I know, you know? I don't know him to be, to be like that. I mean, it's... You don't know me to be aggressive? No, not, not like that, you know? So it's hard to hear sometimes the stories and think like, wow, he actually did that. Yeah. Beyond the bullet holes and amid the shattered glass, it was quite a scene on this quiet Queen Street. It sounded like a string of firecrackers going off, and then somebody said that somebody was shot across the street. 
Shots rang out as many people were watching the ball game. One lady was sitting in her living room when bullets started ricocheting off her ceiling. And I, what's the matter? What you talk? Yeah, we were told by the police not to discuss anything to call the precinct. And then when I looked over, I saw the guy on the floor, and you know, he looked, he had like blood in his neck. This is one of the murders in which Anthony was involved. He'd already spent 16 years in and out of prison. Then, in 2011, facing life for this murder of Mafia rival Joseph Scopo, he decided to cooperate with the authorities. He is now a key FBI witness in cases against his former Colombo bosses. The thing that's shocking for me to hear is just how, you know, when he tells me about the different times away, I think that's like what I have a hard time is just like how could you like go away and be away for you know five years and not be around your kids and your family and then you know come out and jump right back into the same thing that you were doing and then go back again I just I can't I can't wrap my mind around that just all the time lost that's all we know. That's all we know. It's still shocking to you that that was Amy still such a central part of growing up in the life. That's, that's what happened. I don't know. I guess as a mom, it's, I just feel like, you know, he just missed so much. And like, was it worth it for, what, money? I don't know. These home videos were given to us by Linda Scarper. Linda has known nothing except life inside the Mafia. These are pictures of her wedding day. That's it. All right, beautiful. Now, when you get a chance, you're just going to give a little wave goodbye whenever you're ready. She'd been born into one of the most notorious families in the history of the mob. I'd come to the borough of Staten Island to meet her. Her father was Greg Scarper Sr. His mafia life was caked in so much blood that he was known as the Grim Reaper. When were you aware that your father was not quite like other fathers are? I always kind of knew he was different. You know, from my friend's dad's, he, he had a different demeanor, a different way, the way he dressed, his friends dressed, they were very different. Um, he, he didn't act like a nine to five, you know, guy. How much did your father tell you about his life in the mob? He didn't keep a lot from us. Um, up until a certain age, like when we were younger, we really didn't understand much, but as we got older, you know, he was the type of guy that he wanted to be home. You know, he wasn't like these guys that are in the social clubs that like to hang out with the men and play cards. So if you needed to have a meeting with him, and it was during the time that he would, you know, normally be home, which would be after 5.30, you would have to come to the house. Did you overhear a lot about the violent world in which he operated? Yeah, we heard, we heard a lot of it. You know, someone getting killed or someone getting a beating or somebody having a problem with, you know, someone else in the club. You know, all of these things were brought into the house and then we would, we would basically hear it all. He is absolutely the most violent mafioso in the history of Cosa Nostra. The so-called Grim Reaper stopped counting the people he killed personally after they passed 50. For nearly 40 years, Linda's father went on what can only be described as a killing spree. To this day, no one knows how many people he killed. There isn't anything on earth that I will hide from or back up from. 
Were you aware that people in the community treated you differently because you were Greg Scarpa's daughter? Um, yeah, it definitely, you definitely could tell. I mean, no matter where we were, if people knew who I was, they treated me special. You know, a couple of mishaps that I've gotten myself into when I was young, it seems that the people that I was with took the brunt of it. What do you mean? Like, for example, um, I had experimented with uh, smoking pot and I got caught. And the main person that I was with, my dad went after him and beat him badly, almost to death, and left him on uh, the streets. What was your reaction to that? Well, I was devastated because this was somebody that I really cared about. Um, you know, as a kid, he was, my, he was my best friend. He was beaten really bad. I mean, he couldn't even open his eyes. Wow. His eyes were slits, like you couldn't even see them. And they were bright blood red. So, I mean, he looked like somebody, he looked like a monster. What did you think about your father who could be capable of doing this, this loving man who came home for dinner every evening at 5.30, but who was still capable, in circumstances, of doing that to someone else? I was very angry at him for that for a long time. But it's still my father. You know, what was I really gonna do? I guess he figured after time I would get over it. But scars like that, things like that, never really go away. You know, you always have them in the back of your mind. That's an extraordinary kind of life to survive in. Yeah. My only way is not to think about it. That's why I don't have any pictures around my house. Um, because if I think about all that stuff that all the people that I have gone and people that I've lost and the blood and the gore that I did see, you know, I wouldn't be able to sit here and have this conversation with you. I wouldn't be able to do it. First of all, you can never, you can never stand in my shoes. I don't care who you are. I married him. I can't turn around and say I didn't know what he was doing. You know, I'm, I'm in it just as much as he is. He was starting to go out and he was killing people. So as he would kill one person, he would get that more pumped up to go after the next person. Life in the Mafia takes precedence over wives and children. It's a promise to which men swear an oath in blood in a centuries-old secret ceremony. Six years ago, Anthony Russo confronted that choice, mafia or family. He'd been one of the main targets in the FBI's biggest ever mob roundup. On the morning of the raid on his house, his daughter, Tony, was asleep. Command post to all units. 6 a.m., go ahead and execute. 6 a.m., go ahead and execute. The FBI says it is conducting what it calls the biggest mob roundup in New York history. Agents fanned out to arrest more than 100 suspects, suspected mobsters on gambling, drug extortion, and murder charges. Colombo acting capo Anthony Russo is charged with the 1993 murder of underboss Joseph Scopo during the Colombo family war between the Arena and Persico factions. Did it make any sense to you at all what was happening? No, not really. He's just, he was just getting arrested. I never questioned why he ever went to jail in the first place, so I really didn't question it then until it was all over the news. You'd been arrested before. Did you think that this time it was different? I had 63 different charges on the indictment, so I knew it was a major issue. It wasn't, wasn't going to be, make me cop out to two, three years, four years, five years, and then come home. That wasn't happening, you know, so I knew it was a big thing, especially with the murders. And did you do what they said on that list of indictments? Yes, I, I did basically everything they said on that indictment. What was your worst nightmare about what your fate might be then? Life in prison and never seeing my kids, being with them again, and I just came home. I was only home th almost three years at the time. I was in and out my whole life, basically. 
I just kept on thinking about my kids. Seeing your father arrested like that, you would have had absolutely no idea about how long he'd be gone. Yeah. He was gone most of my life, and I was always used to it. But then when he came home the last time, me, him, and my brothers all got extremely close because we were at an age where we were hanging out with our dad, we can do things with him, we go out together. So we got really, really close. Did you have particular views about your father's decision to cooperate with, with the authorities? Um, I was happy that he decided to do that because I'd rather have him here with me than away. Oh, it's a little too much exposure out here right now. It's messy for her. Yeah, too many people passing up and down. I don't want you, I don't want people to keep seeing you over the copy. Run, 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 run. Why'd you wear such tight pants? I always wear these jeans. But they're so tight. Because he chose to cooperate with the FBI, Tony can now have a normal father-daughter relationship. Say hello to Daddy. Daddy. Say I miss you, Daddy. Not so for Maria Scarpa. Her father, Greg Scarpa Jr., was a captain in the Colombo crime family. Even when faced with a long prison sentence, he chose to remain loyal to the Mafia. He's been locked up now for 28 years. His daughter, Maria, lives alone with her child in a small apartment in Brooklyn. On the day I saw her, she'd arranged a telephone call to her father in prison. He has cancer and is in poor health. So I'm actually worried he hasn't called yet, really, because I don't know if they took him to the hospital or if it's a lockdown. There's so many Anything things can happen in happening. there. So many things. Hi, um, I was expecting a phone call from my dad and I didn't get it yet. I was um, wondering if there was a possible lockdown. I'm a little worried about him. Everything's normal right now? Yep. Thank you. Bye. Is it very tough when you don't know what's going on with your father? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll call the prison over and over again. <laughs> Daddy's going to call on the phone now. You tell Daddy when he calls, all right? From the tender age of two, phone calls to the prison have been part of Maria's life. You were only two years of age when your father was on the run and he was eventually captured by the FBI. Yes. What do you remember about that day? <sighs> that day was really hard for me. Um, I know a lot of people won't believe because I was only two years old that I would have any memories, maybe, of something like that. But um, I do because of the closeness me and my father had prior to that incident. And um, I just remember my mom screaming and I remember holding on to him. You, you were holding on to him? Yes. And they were... Wanting to take him away. Yes. I wanted him. You know, he was my main caregiver from the time I was born because my mom had postpartum depression and he did so much for me that we got this bond like usually a mother would kind of have with their child. But the memory of a day like that never Leech. really leaves you. Never. It causes a lot of stress later on in life, like in relationships per se. You never know when something, somebody or somebody you love is going to just be taken from you. Did you ever wish that he had, like some people in the Mafia did, cooperate with the authorities and got a lesser sentence so that you could see more of him? To be honest, I know what it is to take that type of an oath, and I know what it is to them to take that type of an oath, and that's the life. You don't seem to bear any resentment about the way that or how much that has cost you and your life. No, I don't, because, it, again, it was his life. It was what he was born into, 
and it's just the way things are. Kiss Grandpa. Getting it? Yeah. Love you. I love you, Grandpa. Love you. Maria's family life was dominated by the presence of her grandfather, Greg Scarpa Sr. Look in there, say hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. Say up yours. Sure. Daddy, I got my period. So I got my period, Daddy. I like Daddy, Daddy. Yeah? <laughs> Damn, I bet you can't do that. Yet unknown to everyone, the Grim Reaper was for 30 years an FBI informer. Extraordinarily, that arrangement kept him out of prison and free to continue his killing spree. With devastating consequences for his daughter, Linda. One November morning in 1991, Linda was almost killed as she followed her father's car down their street. At this intersection, her father was ambushed by a mafia hit team. A big box truck blocks the street ahead. I heard, you know, some sounds pop, pop, like, sounded like fireworks. When I looked up, there was guys dressed in black surrounding my father's car, shooting at him. Could you determine whether they'd hit your father's car at that point? I seen my father do one of these, like he kind of just like went into the seat. So I wasn't sure if at that point he was hit. I, I didn't know what was happening. Um, I didn't think anyone in that car would survive because they were surrounded. Um, one of the guys in the back seat decided that he was gonna try to fight back. So he jumped out and started shooting. This is from your father's car? Yes, from my father's okay. car, started to shoot at one of the shooters. His gun sprayed into my car. So your car was hit? My car was hit on the passenger side where my son was actually sitting. Um, and you know, while this is all happening, I'm thinking to myself, I, I have to protect my son. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I would, I, I was like in shock. I was kind of like kneeling like this because, you know, gun there's gunfire. And what did your father do? What did his car do? The driver of his car saw an opportunity to squeeze through that stop sign and the, the big truck that was blocking the road. It was a very scary, one of the scariest times of my life, one of. After the attempt on her father's life, Linda eventually got back to the house with her nine-month-old son. Her father soon followed. Next thing I know, he walked into the door and he looked at me and the baby and he had this look of fear in his eyes, like in his face, and he broke down knowing that we were okay because he as well didn't know if we were alive or dead. He became very emotional and then that emotion turned into rage. When you say turned into rage, what do you mean? He turned into this, like an irate psychomaniac. Like he wanted revenge and that was it. After that point, he was starting to go out and he was killing people. For example, he, he went out one night and he killed someone and when he came home, he was so excited that he had killed this person. He hung up his coat. Uh, on the on the rack and said to my mother, you don't even know who I just got. I just got Nikki Black. I shot his nose right off his fucking face. And I was sitting there on the couch with my brother and we were like in shock. Like, you know, it was scary stuff. This is scary stuff. Beyond the bullet holes and amid the shattered glass, it was quite a scene on this quiet Queen Street. It sounded like a string of firecrackers going off. And then when I looked over, I saw the guy on the floor, and you know, he, looked, he had like blood in his neck. Colombo acting capo Anthony Russo is charged with the 1993 murder of underboss Joseph Scopo during the Colombo family war between the arena and personal factions. 
When Anthony Rousseau agreed to testify against his former colleagues in the Mafia, he was offered a place in the government's witness protection program. He decided instead to start a new life in Florida, where he met Amy, a nurse, six months ago. They now live at an undisclosed location. Amy, how much did you know about Anthony's life before you actually started talking? Nothing. He was the guy that lived three doors down that would walk his dog past my house. When did you begin to know something more about him? Probably about a month in. Um, I kept asking. I asked a couple times, you know, well, what's your last name? What's your last name? He would just say, did I ask you your last name? I'm like, no. He was like, well, don't ask me my last he wouldn't name. Tell you. He wouldn't tell me. Uh, we were actually out one night and we got pulled over. And um, he's like, can you grab my uh, envelope out of the glove box, the license and registration he kept in it. And I saw the last name and I just like was like, okay, R-U-S-S-O, just remember that. And so when I got home, I went on the computer and typed it in. What was that moment like when you actually discovered who Anthony was? I was just shocked at the amount because when I typed in and you know, once the image pulled up and it said mafia, I typed in Anthony Russo mafia. And it was just like all the way, you know, just article after article after article. And I was like reading through it and went down to the house, knocked on his door and just said, you know, can I talk to you? And he's like, yeah. She, she just turned around and she just hit the, the pad, the, the iPad she had, and she shows me an image of me. And she goes, is that you? And I said, no, that's not me. I'm better looking than that. <laughs> and then I really, it hit me and I'm like, this girl's Googling me. like and. I was really upset, and I basically just told her, do me a favor and just leave. I said, God, I can't believe you just Googled me to find out who I am. You didn't have no trust in me. You've been with me for like a month already, and I'm, I'm, I am who I am, and you, you don't see what kind of person I am just being with me for the last month and how I act. And, and she was like, oh, why are you so upset? And I said, just go, please. I'm like, what, go home? You know, I was like, should I maybe have not said something? So basically, you would think you did something wrong, right? Yeah. You did. Yeah, thanks. I Google everybody. Google I Google everybody. Is it ever very easy to explain to somebody like Amy just what your life was about? How much, how much detail can you get into? I didn't actually describe, like, what I did if I murdered somebody or if I beat somebody up with baseball bats. I didn't get into all that, you know, but how it's hard. It's hard to explain to people, you know, what I did for a living. It's, it's not easy. Amy, was your first reaction ever to say, this has got to stop, I've got to end this relationship? Nope, not even a thought in my head. That was my thought when she came and showed me my picture. Stop. And I guess a part of me was <clears> like, <throat> the stuff was so long ago and it's, it, he just, to me, he didn't seem like, like I'm not scared of, I tell him all the time, I'm like, I'm not scared of you. Yes, but I'm just, I'm okay. not, you know, I don't feel scared around him or anything. Like he doesn't, you know, I love him. Anthony is probably luckier than most ex-Mafia members to gain the trust of someone like Amy. But not everyone can move on with their lives. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Daddy, Good night, Daddy Ray. I'd come to see Maria Scarper again. This is how she looked in 1988. This home video is one of many made for her father, who is in prison. It was filmed at a large house he once owned on Staten Island. Maria had booked another call to speak to her father. She'd been told when we last tried, he'd been in hospital for a routine health check. Hello. You have a call at no expense to you. 
Scarpa. You may begin speaking now. Hey, baby, what's going on? Hi, Daddy. How are you, baby? I'm doing what's going good. On? I'm actually sitting here with Trevor. Trevor, this is my oh. father. How are you? Good, good, good. All right, all right. You know, we got to keep a positive mind, you know? How, how difficult is it for you to keep a positive mind and keep this relationship with your daughter going? I don't find it difficult at all because, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we just understand one another. You know, this is what we were, uh, the cards that we would dealt. Actually, I dealt them out, uh, made mistakes, and, uh, you know, but she's, uh, you know, she's a loving daughter, and uh, we, we just, that way, you know what I mean? It, it, it's not hard at all, you know. I have a relationship with all my kids. But the hardest bit of all must be that you have missed so many significant parts of their lives. Oh, yes. There's times that, uh, you know, I say to myself and I say, you know, I, I, how did I make this happen? You know, how did I do this? You know what I mean? I got all kinds of pictures, uh, photos, you know, albums. I look at them and I just, just say, wow, look at this. Look what I missed. Look what I missed. You know, it hurts. You know, it, it definitely hurts. Given the great cost this has been to you, to your family and to your daughter, did you ever think of did you ever think of cooperating with the authorities, which would have made your life possibly easier? Uh, yeah, you know, like it was uh, it was a thing like that. Uh, you know, when when I first uh, got arrested, I said to myself, you know, how could I do that? My father was still alive. I said I just can't do, and uh, you know, it just went that way. You know. But the example is that your father did cooperate with the authorities, didn't he? He was, uh, you know, he became quite notorious for that. I would call him a master manipulator, okay? Because he didn't actually cooperate. I mean, he, what he did was he manipulated. He used uh, those people, the, the FBI, the way he had to use them to continue staying out in the street. He was on, like, both sides of the fence. What he got away with, people say that this guy was an actual genius. But when you sit back in some of your more sober moments, do you, do you think me and my father have really made Maria pay a very, very heavy price for what you, you both have done? Yes, I say that. And, and that's why, like, uh, you know, she's, she's my honey. She, she understands that, uh, you know, this, this was, was dealt to her. And, you know, and uh, listen, I apologize to her. One minute remaining. We got a minute remaining. Okay, Daddy, I'll talk to you later. I love you. All right. All right. Love you, sweetheart. I'll talk to you tonight, okay? Okay, say goodnight to Daddy. Bye, Daddy. And I love you. Love you. Mommy loves you. Mommy loves you. Unlike her father, Maria's grandfather, Greg Scarpa Sr., was free to be with his children as they grew up because of the deal he'd made with the FBI. For his daughter, Linda, these images bring back nothing but pain. Her younger brother, Joey, was murdered by the Mafia when he was only 23. Her father had died a few months before of AIDS from an infected blood transfusion. They are both buried in the same grave. This was originally supposed to be the spot for my father and my mother. It was just, um, let's put them together since my brother was missing him so much. It just, it just felt right to keep them together. What sort of a person was he, your brother Joey? Um, my brother was such a funny person. He was, he was really a good-hearted kid. I call him a kid because, you know, to me, he's always my little brother. He always had nicknames for everybody. Um, he always joked around, always laughed. I mean, always laughed. The sad part about my brother is that he really didn't want to be involved in this type of life. And even though he wasn't technically in the mafia, he came from my father. That's, you know, my father's son. So he, he got involved in street life. And um, when you get involved in drugs in that life, it, it, there's never a good outcome ever for any one of them. Your father's life in the Mafia must have br brought you pain, which at times seemed absolutely intolerable. 
Okay, when you're living that life and, you know, you see your dad going out and committing these crimes, it's, it's obviously hard to deal with and it's painful. But you don't realize the pain until it ha actually hits your home. You know, until you actually have someone murdered. Do you know how to come off the gas pedal at all? I do come off the gas pedal. No, you don't. I'm you off just it right drive. now. Go slow. I wasn't even going fast. I'm getting a headache. Oh, I can tell. Oh, you God. Really want to. I need more blood pressure pills. I tell you to slow down, you tell me you're not going fast. I'd arranged to see former Colombo captain Anthony Russo and his daughter Tony again. Right here. Beautiful parking. Perfect. Thank you, I try. The street where his children grew up is now a place that haunts him. It's a good man. That's what you say. That's what, That's not what the feds say. Think, yeah, well. <laughs> Despite his new life in Florida, his former career is always a cause of regret. A few months ago, his son Michael died of an accidental drugs overdose. He was 20 years of age. The entire neighborhood turned out for a nighttime vigil. Michael's nickname is still etched on the street in candle wax. I'm just amazed how this, how this it stained the ground like this. It's been here since the... Almost three months now. I think it might be here forever. In the natural course of things, Anthony, you're not supposed to bury your kids. No, you're not supposed to bury your kids. The kids are supposed to bury you. It's hard for me to talk about him, because I, I miss him. What do you remember about him? Everything. I'm sorry. The tragedy must be all the more terrible for you when you look back on your life and remember all the time you spent in prison away from Michael and your family. Yeah, that's, like I said, that's a regret that I'm never gonna live down. You, you know, he's, he was 20 years old when he passed away. And I spent, out of his 20 years, almost 11, 12 years in prison. So basically had eight, nine years of his life together with him. It's, it's a hard thing to accept. Tony, do you feel that your father blames himself for Michael's death? Um, I feel like he regrets not being there. I mean, blames himself. If he did, he, sh he really shouldn't. I, could, I know for a fact he blames himself that he wasn't there enough and that he spent all that time away from him, but this was a freak accident. There was no, nothing no one could do. Did you manage to keep Michael away from the life that you led? Well, I try to keep all my kids away from the life I live. I used to tell them all the time, I'm the perfect example of what not to do in life. If you just do the opposite of what daddy does, you guys would be great in life. It's a difficult path to tread, to tell, yes, to tell your children not to do what, I'm doing. what you did. Fathers are usually examples. Right, I didn't want them to lead be, me be an example for them. I was the worst example for them. And I knew it. And I used to tell them all the time. I used to tell my daughter the same thing. Mm -hmm. I used to tell her, don't ever bring a guy. If I, you ever bring somebody home that reminds me of me, I'm throwing them right out the door. Do not do that, I said. Just go find some geek some ways to tell them. Tony, did your father succeed in keeping you away from the life he led? Y yes. I don't like being around people like that. I don't like watching movies like that. I don't like anything that does has to do with anything. During my time in Brooklyn, I'd met the daughters of three senior figures in the Colombo crime family. Hi. Hi. I love you. They all live with the profound consequences of their father's involvement in the Mafia. 
For Linda Scarper, the scars are visible even today. At our final meeting, she agreed to share with me a few memories captured on old home videos. She's been unable to watch them for years. I would say that it's definitely over 15 years I haven't watched it. My father wanted to kill my ex-husband because he, he felt... wanted to kill him? He wanted to kill my, my ex-husband because uh, this was at a point where my father was very sick and he felt that my ex-husband was not treating me right, so he wanted to kill him. So he asked me permission to kill my husband. He asked you permission? He couldn't do it without... To kill your husband? ...asking me because he wanted to know that that's what I wanted. He wanted to make sure that he didn't have to live with any guilt, that that was something that I would hate him for or not want. But he was putting the guilt on you. I don't think he saw it that way. But I, of course I said, no, I don't want you to kill him. I'm relieved to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and the groove cuts the cake. The groove cuts the cake. I know the devil, the groove cuts the cake. The pictures that evoke the darkest memories were, rather strangely, those of her coming of age party on her 16th birthday. But that was a happy day. I mean, my sweet 16 definitely was, definitely was a great party. <laughs> Of Linda's life, I'm talking about Daddy. Come on down to my candle number 16. And as they say that, you'll see him smiling from ear to ear. He just couldn't believe that that's what was said, you know. Just to see him so happy like that made me happy. You can see, you know, the both of us were just. That part right there is just like, I mean, look at him. Does that look like somebody that would hurt somebody? No. He was just, I mean, to me, he's an extraordinary person, extraordinary man that just, I think, made a lot of mistakes. But look at him. I mean, he was the love of my life. He, he was, you could see it. I mean, <laughs> he was chewing gum. He never chewed gum. That's how nervous he was. When you look back, do you think that was one of the sort of happiest times of your growing up life? Um, yeah. It was a good day. Happy birthday, Linda. But looking back, I mean, I had everything right there. <laughs> Next time, you seem to be saying that the betrayal of talking to the authorities is almost as bad as the infidelity. Yes, I do believe that. I do believe that. I meet the wives, and we gain unprecedented access to a wedding in a secret community 